Organizations are spending millions on sustainability, whether it's about trying to achieve goals or looking at how to comply with regulation. But did you know that approximately 80% of a product's environmental impact is determined at the design phase? My name is Iris Alting and I'm a climate response innovator at PA. Today we're here at PA's Global Innovation and Technology Center. We're going to talk about how design for sustainability works in real life. Hi Tom, so how does it work, design for sustainability? Hi Iris, so I think maybe the best way of explaining what design for sustainability is, is if we compare a traditional design process with a sustainable design process. So in a traditional design process you would normally be juggling three core drivers to a project and these would be cost, function and performance. And with sustainable design all you're really doing is adding two additional elements and these are social and environmental impacts. And the reason why this is so important is because it not only allows us to meet the sustainability goals for today, but also enables future generations to meet the sustainability goals in the future. And how do you apply design for sustainability in your daily job? So the way that we approach it here at PA is to adopt the life cycle approach. So what that really means is that we don't really consider products as standalone items. We try and view them in the holistic, bigger sense of this full system that they sit in. So that includes how and where the, man the raw materials are sourced from, how the product is manufactured, how it gets distributed, how it gets used, and ultimately where the product ends up in its end of life. We also need to consider adjacent industries that might be affecting that system, which wouldn't normally be in control, but they're also super important. And it's only through then looking at the full life cycle do you, can you start to understand where the biggest environmental and social impacts lie so that you can then address them and try and tackle them. So our role as designers is not really just to try and focus on making designs more sustainable, we're actually trying to make the whole system more sustainable. And we like to say here at PA that actually sustainable solutions are led by strategy, they're grounded in science, they're solved with engineering and they're brought to life with design. But the truth is collaboration and partnerships are essential if you want to achieve breakthrough solutions. Thank you, Tom. And I think especially the comment you made about how different stakeholders across the supply chain need to be engaged is really key here. I think we're going to see you in a little while, but for now we're going to have a look at how some of these examples work in practice. We're now in one of PA science labs, and I'm joined by material scientist Viju Fusishta. Hi Viju, thank you so much for letting us into your lab. Hi Iris, it's great to talk to you today. This looks really interesting. Can you maybe tell us more about what it is? Yeah, so this is called the tea sheet and this is really um, um, a product which we have developed here at PA in GITC as an alternative to the incumbent tea bags. So this is a completely plastic free alternative to the tea bags which you find in the supermarkets. Lots of people may not even know that most of the tea bags, at least the commodity tea bags, they contain um, a level of plastic. Some of them may contain up to 20 to 25 percent plastic. So tea bag is one classic um, product which, which has plastic, but it's kind of well hidden. So hence we at PA looked into, hey, what can we do with re reducing the plastic in the tea bags? And that's really what you're seeing today is the birth of the tea sheet. Now that's really interesting. And Tom Leach has been telling us about the importance of working with scientists and other disciplines when designing for sustainability. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more how that worked for you in practice? Yeah, as you know, Aris, we, we always work together in a very collaborative way and as a very cross-functional team. So that's very much the journey we have taken with the T-sheets as well. So we started off with Tom and his team looking into coming up with some ideas for how do we reduce plastic and some concepts for um, an alternative to the tea bags? And then it came to the, the fundamental science piece, which I'll talk to you a bit later about. And then we looked into getting on with our engineering colleagues to see how we can look into scaling up and manufacturing the tea sheet. So it's really a very collaborative approach we have taken in the development of these um, tea sheet prototypes. And how did this work for the tea sheet? Yeah, this is a good question, actually, because what is so unique about the T-sheets is it's a matrix of 
tea leaves, which you can find in any uh, tea bags, which we have then integrated into a pulp-based matrix without actually using any plastic components. So we had to really think on our feet about how do we come up with this integrating the tea leaves into the pulp and we had to come through, you know, go through at least 30 to 40 different ways of integrating the leaves into the pulp, but also to make sure that once the tea sheet is formed, when you put it into a nice cup of hot water, it doesn't fall apart. So that's where the, the uniqueness of this is, which really has the potential to revolutionize the, the tea bag market. Thank you, Fiji, for sharing your scientific point of view when designing for sustainability. That was really encouraging. Thanks, Iris. It was great to talk to you. I am now at one of PA's manufacturing labs, where we develop and pilot new production systems. I'm joined by Jamie Stone, one of PA's sustainable packaging experts. Jamie, could you tell us a little bit more about the factor you consider when designing products at scale and speed? Sure. Firstly, we start with our strategy. We work with pretty much all of the big consumer companies in the world looking at replacing some of their commodity plastic. When replacing plastics, you really need to think through what's the most appropriate material for the product, for the barrier, for the supply chain, for the cost. One of the examples is Polpac. Polpac's a technology that's essentially just pure paper. We shred it in something called a hammer mill, which takes the fibers and rips them into a small continuous bed. When you get those fibres, they're now very loose. They have almost no structure at all. We then take those fibres and we put them on a press. We use a, a combination of pressure and temperature. So it will take that material and compress it, and if you try that, it fuses it into a, a solid form. These bowls are, they're dummies, but they're for things like sauce pots or moisturiser. Another example are bottles. There are quite a lot of companies looking to replace plastic with paper. Our technology is appropriate for that also. Here's a bottle we've been making recently. So this is again exactly the same, 100% paper. So what do manufacturers need to consider when they replace their current packaging materials to a material like Pullpack? Yeah, good question. Of course, things in their supply chain are need to change. It's a new material and it's handled in a different way. Here's a good example of a, a tablet blister we're making with our Pullpack material. The input to this material into the factory would be very different. We need to learn how to handle paper and paper fibers air management systems and, and things like that. But equally we need to make sure we're using as much of their capital as we can. So we're very sensitive about what needs to change and what can stay to make sure it's as cost effective as it can be during the development and also when it gets to manufacture. So it's not just thinking about changing the product and the material and the design of the product itself, but again very much thinking about what else is happening throughout that supply chain and what other products might already be involved. Absolutely. And also a really important thing, we, we actively try to not sell just a material change but a consumer experience enhancement. All of these products are there because consumers want them. We want to design for the new consumer experience in a new material, in a supply chain that needs to get to scale and cost. Thank you, Jamie. And I think this is a great example of how we can adapt manufacturing in producing new products. So here we are at one of PA's design studios and I'm joined by industrial designer Ryan McGingley. Hi Ryan, we're exploring how design for sustainability works in practice and we've already looked at science and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. A question for you, how do you think this impacts the business model? So sometimes uh, it's not the product itself uh, that needs to change, uh, but often it's how the product is sold and used uh, that can really change and disrupt the business model. Um, and a great example of that is the Rock Rose Gin that we worked for. Uh, they're an award-winning um, gin company owned by Dunnett Bay Distillers, uh, who are the, the UK's most northerly distillery. Uh, and as you can see um, from their product, they're using a, a ceramic bottle, which has fantastic brand equity, um, and is, is really nice to hold in the hand, uh, and stands out on a shelf. Dunnett Bay Distillery are a very environmentally conscious company, um, so it was very clear that there was a, a great opportunity to explore refill um, and make that ceramic bottle a bottle for life. So how did you go doing this? So PA works closely with a wide range of consumer clients to design products and packaging solutions. Uh, we often work in multidisciplinary teams full of um, scientists, engineers and industrial designers. Uh, this project was no different. 
Um, so we had uh, industrial designers exploring different forms and openings. Uh, we had engineers who looked to re redesign the manufacturing processes. And we also had our um, applied scientists um, very quickly come to the conclusion that we needed uh, a multi-layer laminate in this product to, to lock in the gin freshness, but to also give you that shelf life uh, that the gin would need in, in storage and in supply chain. So Ryan, do I understand correctly that we actually have two different packaging going on mm -hmm. here? Yeah, absolutely. That's the, the whole premise behind the concept. So uh, that original packaging that you get in the supermarket or you get online, uh, you just buy that once. Uh, and then what you do is you take your pouch and you decant back into your um, ceramic bottle uh, and you use that for multiple, multiple times. And then all you simply do at the end here is you take your empty pouch and you put it in the, um, the post box and it gets sent back to a specialist recycler. Fantastic. So it gets recycled all the way at the end. Yeah. So Ryan, could you tell us a little bit more about the impact of these changes? Yeah, it was a great success. Uh, consumers loved the refill pouches. It's what they'd been asking for going into the distillery. Um, the free post recycling was a huge hit. People simply dropping them into to Royal Mail post boxes for recovery. Um, and it's been such a success that it's been rolled out across the entire portfolio of Dunnett Bay Distillers, gins and vodkas. Fantastic. Thank you so much for explaining this in a little bit more detail. And I think another great example of design for sustainability, where we're not only looking at redesigning the current products, mm. but look at different stakeholders across the supply chain as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Hi, Tom. Great to see you again. We've just seen many different examples of design for sustainability and how it works both with diverse teams as well as looking at the full life cycle approach. Yes. So, so design actually touches loads of elements on the design process. Um, whether that's from low impact solutions through to piloting new business models. But creating sustainable products is only really possible if you're combining disciplines across science, engineering, design, supply chains, um, and, and you're all using the approach of the full life cycle. And what do you think the future of design for sustainability looks like? So actually it's really exciting. So as a society, I think well, there's still a long way to go before we start to see the things that we do become more sustainable. But we're seeing more and more organisations starting to make the more informed decisions and critically earlier in the life cycle, which is really encouraging. But not only is it really exciting, is that we're also starting to see regulations start to inform sustainability, which is actually having the effect of empowering governments and big businesses to really start to try and incentivize and inform behavior change to become much more desirable. And products influence behaviors and vice versa, and both need to be handled together. And is this an area where PA is active in as well? Yeah, absolutely. So we've just finished a project working with the UK government that's all about adopting the rollout of electric vehicles. Um, we're also working with an American company that's trying to pioneer and promote the consumption of alternative intensively farmed proteins. But we're also working widely to try and increase the uptake of vaccinations. And we're doing that by designing a refrigerator uh, that uses solar power to keep those vaccines cool as they're distributed to different parts of the world. Thank you, Tom. I think it's also great to see that PA is leading in so many of these projects. And that's it for today's episode of How Things Work here at PA's Global Innovation and Technology Centre. We hope to see you again soon.